Good evening, everyone. My name is Sam, and on behalf of Book Soup, I'd like to thank you all for joining us for our next virtual event with Dr. Yaba Blay and Jamila Lemieux here to discuss One Drop Shifting the Lens on Race. We'll be hosting more virtual events in the near future, and you can learn more about them on our website by signing up for our email newsletter, as well as following us on social media at Book Soup. And you can follow our Crowdcast page here. Our next event is this coming Thursday at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard instead of 6. They're usually at 6 with Amy Solomon discussing her new book, Notes from the Bathroom Line. Past events are also available on our YouTube channel. This one will be as well, in addition to um, being recorded here on Crowdcast. So tonight's event will end with a Q&A. And to submit a question, please use the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen. And if you see a question on the list that you'd like for our speakers to answer, please click the like button and it'll bump it up in the queue. And we'll try to answer as many questions as time will allow. And please also feel free to engage with each other and our speakers in the chat area. Also, please support Book Soup and our author tonight by purchasing a copy of tonight's featured book, which you can do by clicking the green button right below the viewer screen. It'll redirect you to our website where you can finish the checkout process. And we are selling digital audiobooks and ebooks through Libro FM and Kobo as well for those interested. Right now, it's really important to support your independent bookstore, and Book Soup is not unique to any other. So, um, we, if you haven't gotten a copy, please consider um, purchasing from us or your local independent bookstore. And with that said, let me introduce our guests for this evening. Dr. Yaba Blay is a scholar, activist, and cultural creative whose work centers on the lived experiences of Black women and girls. She has launched viral campaigns, including Pretty Period and Professional Black Girl, and has appeared on CNN, BET, MSNBC, and NPR. Dr. Blay's work has been featured in the New York Times, Ebony, Essence, and The Root. A thought leader on Black racial identity, colorism, and beauty politics, she is a globally sought after speaker and consultant. Connect with her online at yabablay.com. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you for having me. And our in-conversation guest tonight is Jamila Lemieux, who is a cultural critic and writer whose work on issues of race, gender, and sexuality has established her as one of today's preeminent feminist thinkers and media mavericks. Lemieux's writing has been featured in The Cut, The Washington Post, and Ebony, where she served as senior editor. She's appeared as a commentator on dozens of national and international news programs, and she was prominently featured in Lifetime's docuseries, Surviving R. Kelly. It is an honor to have both of you here with us tonight. I'm personally really excited for this. So thank you so much for joining us. And without further ado, I'm gonna turn the camera over to you both and everyone else in the audience. Thank you for joining us. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the presentation. Awesome. Hi, Jamila. Hi, Yava. <laughs> Good evening, y'all. Thank y'all for being here. I'm excited for tonight's conversation. Jamila and I always have interesting conversations when it comes to colorism. Um, so to get us started, or before we get started, I want to give a brief presentation on the book. For those of you who have been joining me on this virtual tour, it will look familiar, so give me a few minutes. I do want to give folks who haven't been a part of the conversation an opportunity to at least get some grounding in what the book is about before we get started. So I'm going to share my screen. Yay. Um, let me see. All right, can y'all see that? Yeah? Okay, good. So the book, One Drop Shifting the Lens on Race by me with photography direction by Noelle Tayard is a book that focuses on black, black racial identity and skin color politics. And in many ways it represents a conversation about blackness and engages questions of who's black, who's not, who cares and why. Rather than tell you specific details of the book, because of course you're gonna click that green button and get your own. And let me say this, thankfully the book sold out fairly quickly within like 24 hours. We are waiting for shelves to be restocked, but Book Soup does have some copies. So if you haven't been able to get your hands on a copy just yet, now is your chance. Go ahead and click that button and get your copy. Um, but again, for now, I just want to give you some context to understand how it is and why it is I decided to do this particular project. So generally speaking, my work focuses on the lived experience of Black people, capital B, of course, thinking of people of African descent throughout the diaspora. And for me, Blackness is 
not just a racial identity, but a political one, one that not only reflects race, but also reflects culture. And within my work on blackness, I tend to focus on body politics, beauty practices, colorism, hair politics, et cetera. Pretty straightforward, right? We'll flash back to 2010. I was on a panel with this woman, Rosa Clemente, hip hop activist, community organizer, 2008 Green Party vice presidential candidate. And so we were on this panel for the Caribbean Cultural Center in New York City. We were asked to have a conversation about colorism in the diaspora. And for as learned and as well-versed as I am, or as I thought I was on colorism, because that's my thing, I found myself taken aback, distracted even, every single time Rosa would identify as a Black Puerto Rican woman from the South Bronx. Yes, I know Puerto Ricans. I know lots of them. I know technically Puerto Ricans are of some African descent, but I, at the time, had never met anyone who was Puerto Rican who identified as Black Puerto Rican or led with their Blackness. I didn't grow up in a community with a lot of Latinx folks and certainly not with a lot of Afro Latinx folks because I grew up black as I am in New Orleans, Louisiana. And there you're either black, white or Creole, at least in my experience. And in my experience, folks who had the privilege of identifying as Creole did. And as far as I was concerned, they were only identifying as Creole so they didn't have to identify as black. In my experience, many Creoles rejected blackness as an identity. And in my experience, many Creoles rejected me. I remember not being invited to the birthday party of one of my very best elementary school friends because she said her mama said I was too black. Many years later, I was also not invited to the wedding of a colleague for similar reasons. So as far as I was concerned, Creoles didn't want to be Black and didn't have to be. And so anytime I encountered one or anyone who even looked like one, I already knew who they were or who they weren't, or so I thought. But in meeting Rosa, I started questioning a lot. I started rethinking what I knew, uh, not only about folks who looked a particular way, but about blackness as an identity in general. And so I embarked on this project and wanted to investigate what I was calling at the time, I was calling the project the other side of blackness. I interviewed over 70 people representing 25 different countries and countries of origin, ranging in age from 21 to 103. And in the book, 58 of them are included. The book not only features short narratives, which I wrote based upon our interviews, but they all, it also includes portraits of each of the contributors. So again, shout out to Noelle Teilhard, who directed the project's photography, and she created many of these portraits herself. <clears throat> While many of the contributors use a variety of terms to self-identify, they all see themselves as part of the larger racial and cultural group generally referred to as Black folks. All of them have had the experience of having their identity called into question based upon their appearances, and most of them have been asked either, what are you, or the more politically correct, where are you from, time and time again. And so in our conversations, the very first question that I asked each of them was, how do you identify racially and culturally? Black Puerto Rican. Black from Louisiana. Black Latina. Black and or mixed race mixed and or black, black of mixed heritage, Afro-Cuban and or black, African-American, black, African, mixed and or Jamaican, black, 
Black American Muslim. Black. I want to tell you a little bit about this woman here. One of the first people I interviewed, her name is Danielle. And we were classmates in graduate school uh, in African-American studies. And to be quite honest, I didn't fool with her <laughs> at all, primarily because our department as a black studies department was uh, naturally a very black space, right? Not only by way of the folks who occupied the halls, but in the ways that we operated, how we functioned, how we interacted with one another. And Danielle somehow just didn't fit. Like she would come to the A4 Gladfelter where our department was and she just wouldn't speak to people, right? Now black people, y'all know good and well that you don't enter a space full of black people and not speak at least to somebody. And she didn't speak. So me being me and me connecting my own dots with my own experience, to me, Danielle, in both her appearance and her vibe, reminded me a lot of folks who looked like her in New Orleans, right? Mm -hmm. Folks who identified as Creole, primarily because she was acting <laughs> like a lot of them had acted towards me. And so I didn't fool with her. Then later, right before she graduated, she uh, finished the program with her master's degree. I continued um, into the doctorate program. But one of our mutual professors asked me to read her final paper for his class. He thought that given the work that I do, I would find it really interesting. And after much resistance, I read the paper. And what I learned from the paper put a lot of her behavior into context for me. So Danielle is the daughter of a white Mennonite mother and an African-American father. She grew up in a Mennonite community here in Pennsylvania. Um, Temple is in Philly. I live in Philly. For those of you who have been to Philly, you know Philly is a very black city, right? But once you leave Philly, you are in Klan country. And I'm not even being funny. Like the largest numbers of Klan activity have historically happened in the state of Pennsylvania, right? So she grew up in that yeah. Pennsylvania, right? Um, and so there it was very clear to people that she was black to the extent that she was bothered and she was bullied and she even stopped going to high school, right? Then she moved to Philly to go to Temple. And here, uh, it wasn't so clear, at least not to black folks, that she was black. And she was just quiet, not that she was necessarily being rude or that she thought she was better than anybody, but given her own experiences, she wasn't necessarily sure that she would be welcome. One thing she was sure about, however, was that she was black or to use her own self-identifying terminology that she is black and Mennonite. Part of the purpose of this book is to examine how it is that we as black people come to identify and define ourselves. Historically, this graphic represents what it means to be black by law. In the history of the United States, a black person has been defined as any person with any known black African ancestry. Although this has been referred to as the one black ancestor rule, the traceable amount rule, and the rule of hypo descent, it's more popularly known as the one drop rule, meaning that one single solitary drop of black blood is enough to render a person black. Said differently, the one drop rule holds that a person with any trace of black African ancestry, however small or invisible, cannot be considered white. They must be considered black. So what's interesting and important for us to make note of is that in as much and in so far as the law set out to define blackness, it was really set out to protect whiteness, right? That it also inadvertently defined whiteness and the language that they use was pure, right? So to be considered white, one had to be considered pure. If we pull out your family tree, we go back how many generations? One, two, three, five generations. One person in those five generations is black, you are black. You should know that no other ethnic group is defined or counted according to this one drop rule. You should also know that the one drop rule is characteristically American. 
meaning that in no other country or society does this rule have any applicability or even make any bit of sense for that matter. In fact, in so many other places for a person of African descent, one drop of anything else is enough to categorize them as something else. In the introduction of the book, I map out a brief history of how it is that the United States came to adopt such a specific and seemingly quantifiable definition of Black identity. And it was important for me to provide this context first, because again, when I set out to do this work, this in my mind was a conversation for and about Black folks, for us to begin to think critically about how our racial identity is to define, how it is that we even come to define ourselves. Many of us, particularly given the history of enslavement, we've come to accept the one drop rule as truth, right? As, as just the way it is. But the reality is we didn't create it. Because we didn't create it, many other of us, many others of us reject the one drop rule outright, right? Particularly because it doesn't originate with us. So once we come to understand this history, once we come to understand how it is that Blackness was defined by law, my question is, does that necessarily mean that we should reject it altogether? And if the answer is yes, then my next question is, how then might we quantify Blackness as a group identity? How then might we qualify Blackness as a group identity? Who would be Black and why? or better stated, who would be black and how? And even a, a better question is, who would be in a position to make that determination, right? Who would be in charge? Who would be in a position to create a definition of blackness for us? And so a large part of what I've attempted to do with this project is again, to get us to reimagine blackness, if you will. It's definitely not my goal to tell people how to identify it. I'm more interested in learning how it is that folks come to identify themselves. But it is, however, my goal to get us to understand that racial identity isn't just fact, right? It isn't just a given truth, that there are politics at play when we come to think about ourselves racially, and I want us to begin to start thinking critically about that. Okay, that's all for now. Uh, did I stop sharing my screen? Yep. Okay, good. Okay, so now we can talk. <laughs> now we can talk. Now we can talk. Ah. Yeah, but um, whew, I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about and in conversation with folks um, about this very subject in the time since I had you on my show a few weeks ago, pardon me, to talk about your book. Yeah. Uh, and something that came up for me in some of those conversations that, that comes up for me again, um, hearing this presentation um, from you again, and, and your, when you talk about your experiences with um, the young, oh, Danielle, right? Yeah. With Danielle and how your reaction to her was based on two things. One, her behavior. So it wasn't that Danielle wasn't the one coming in with muffins and big smiles and hugs. So she was making it easy for you to put her in this grouping with whom you have this lived experience, right? Something I'm grappling with. There's this expectation that black folks who are not like complexioned Right, because the experiences of you, you can have a Danielle who has two black parents and looks that way, right? right? And, and could have a very similar set of experiences, perhaps not in terms of the bullying. Maybe she's the only black girl, and so she's still experiencing that bullying in her community, but not the biracial experience, but having the experience of being a black girl. But when she steps into a space with um, other black folks, there are privileges that are conferred, right? Or that can be accessed. Um, even if she doesn't always, you know, tap into them or if she's not aware, if she's not made aware of them or if somehow some other behavior or something else about her perhaps uh, doesn't allow her the full access to them. Either way, she is a part of this privileged class. So she's disenfranchised where she's from. Right. But where she, this other place where she's from, which is the black community, she's a part of this privileged group. And so there's this, very complicated ask that's made of, of light complexion and, and mixed race black people and of 
black people who do not have that experience, right? Brown complex, you know, browner skin, darker complexion, black people. There's this expectation that you all are to allow us all the empathy and grace and understanding that comes with being part of this black thing because you're my brother, you're my sister. We are family. We are in this shit together. And I know you suffer at the hands of white supremacy, right? I can't tell you that you don't. I know that you do. We are all family. That is what we are looking for from our from our darker brothers and sisters. We want that to be part of this thing. And and there are but so few of us that are willing to even own up to the privilege at all. And even the ones that do, the best they can give you is it's not fair. I didn't ask for this. I'm sorry. You know, and perhaps thinking in, in these broad strokes of their own life that they're not participating in upholding and maintaining colorism but also not weeding, willing to uh, redistribute, right? Some of the things that you might've been given access to or to interrogate that, hey, I can be disenfranchised and hurt and harmed and, and also you know, rhythmic and, and colorful and beautiful and all the great things about being black too. It's not just a struggle. I'm, I'm, I'm experiencing both of these things, but I'm also having this experience that other black people are not having. And I don't think that most of us know how to operate in the space of I'm not having the same black woman experience as, as right. other black women. It is still a black woman experience, right. right? White women are not having my experience. I'm not having a white woman's experience, but I'm having a light skinned black woman's experience. So when you going back to that time with Danielle and you, you read this story about her. And so I guess the other side of it is the quite natural assumptions that one might make about somebody who's having that experience that's based on not just what you may have heard, but what you've lived, right? right. So how many Creole girls have to treat you a certain way right. before the, you meet a Creole girl and you're closed off? It doesn't mean that you, you have to be aggressive or hostile or anything like that, but that you simply, this is not a person who I am going to extend myself to, whereas I might have seen another student, you know, who seems withdrawn or shy or awkward and kind of tap them on the shoulder. I know what this is. So when you you go back in, into your life before you've had this experience with Danielle and, and before you've had this experience with Rosa and this storytelling, are there relationships that you've gone back and been like, I would perhaps handle this differently. Or maybe I was not clear on what was going on with this person, or I just didn't, you know, I just wasn't open. And so because I wasn't open, we just didn't get to know each other. You know, it's, it's hard to say because when I look at my circle of friends, you know, from then to now, I, I think we run the whole spectrum of complexions. But what I will say, a commonality, you know, so even if I think of like you or if I think of, of many of my, my light skin girlfriends are probably a little bit more woke than others. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? They're probably a little bit more, um, I don't want to say aware because it's bigger than aware, right? That they, they, they recognize the privileging that comes with light skin. They're clear about how colorism functions and they see it as a problem. And it's not just like, Oh yeah, I know that happens and I'm still living my life, but they're also very like, you know, that's, that's not it. We're not okay. doing it, right. Like, and I'm calling it out as best that I can. And I think if I'm honest, that might be what, ooh, I was about to say that might be what I require, yeah. you know, in order to feel safe, you know, in order to feel even recognized in, in terms of my, my full experience and not constantly feel like I have to explain and or make you feel okay with the messed up shit that I experienced. You know what I mean? I don't know if that makes sense, but it's almost like there's just a given foundation that we're clear that the world operates in a particular way. In the same way, if I, if I count my white friends, they're yeah. clear about how white supremacy functions. Right. This is not a conversation or an argument or I don't constantly feel like I have to teach you something right. just for you to understand my lived experience. It's a given, you know, it's it's a starting point. Even we can move from that place. And so outside of that, you know, yeah, I don't I, I can't think of any other. It's interesting, though, because, you know, Rosa was the catalyst in terms of even getting me to stop and pause and say, you know, there might be a lot that I'm missing out on in terms of just 
understanding the fullness and the breadth of what the black experience might be, that there is another side of blackness, right? Not to put them on equal playing ground at all, or not to somehow negate everything that I knew up until that point, but to say in fairness and in truth, if I want to understand the full insidious nature of white supremacy, right? Recognizing how it operates across the color spectrum for all of us. It's interesting. It's one of the reasons why I use the language colorism to speak specifically about skin color politics in the ways that it disadvantages folks of, of darker complexion, right? The textbook mm -hmm. definition of colorism. But I also use the general term of skin color politics because it allows me to look at the politics of skin color across you know, the spectrum. I would never say reverse colorism, you know what I mean? But to open up the conversation broadly, but I think it's important for us to recognize that again, for me, you know me, I'm always gonna come back and point to white supremacy, right? So while we are internally fighting amongst each other, recognizing that we didn't do this to ourselves and that it is reflective of a larger hierarchy and a larger system that was designed for us to actually interact in these ways. I think I, uh, you know, when I first heard about the book, you, you know, before it came out, right? Like I remember thinking, oh, that that's the sort, you know, that would have been an interesting thing for my dad to have been interviewed in, right? Because I have a very light complexion, mixed race father, um, who's got an interesting story of being, you know, raised only by the white parent, and you know, being super pro black and 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 living exclusively in black spaces. And so when the book showed up in my life. I saw it and I was like, a lot of these people look like me. That's interesting, right? Because, but because I am not a. I'm sitting here wondering why I didn't ask you, why I didn't interview you. Did I, I don't think we knew, we didn't, I don't, I don't think we, knew we didn't other. know each other that well yet. I think we were just kind of being, I think this was around the time that we, for, I remember anticipating the book. I think we had just connected though. Okay. okay. Um, but, you know, I thought of it for him because I was like, you know, I'm, I don't think of, I have a mixed parent who identifies as black and like many of the, the people in the book who use the word, you know, identify as black or they'll say I identify as black and mixed, you know, obviously I'm mixed, dot, 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 but they're, you know, but the, what they identify with in their spirit and their soul, who they think of themselves as in the world is as black people. And so having had two parents, right, who that's their experience and my mother is, you know, not biracial um, and is, dark complex, is a dark complexion woman, I, that like I just I didn't expect so many of these people to look like me, hmm. and that kind of messed me up a little bit. I think that when the in the first release that probably killed a little bit of my enthusiasm for it because I couldn't sit on my two black parent high horse because that it is an invisible high horse because of the way one of my two black parents looks right, and so that I that I I don't look like most people who have two black parents, but I think that in a lot of ways I have a mindset that a lot of other light complexion people who may have two black parents have not had because of how color was performed in maybe their family and their parents relationship you know like have you seen the movie sylvia's love not yet i haven't so so it's a very sweet movie um and i want to ask you about seeing movies and, and what you see and what you don't see in a second um it's a very very nice movie the lead one of the lead characters, Tessa Thompson's um, Sylvie, is a black woman played by and who Tessa, Tessa Thompson is a biracial actress, right? And I will say that I have gotten to the point where my frustration at seeing biracial actresses portray characters who have two black parents is like, we have to stop doing this. You know, it's it's, it's not to be fair, it's not impossible that this light complexion black woman and this dark complexion black man could have been Tessa Thompson's parents, yeah. but it's just how often are we going to continue, right? It becomes almost like, is this some sort of aspirational thing? If your family makes enough money, you can have some biracial children too, like the Huxtables, you know, like how, how? okay, there's a, an array of colors, but these two would not, this is impossible, right? Like uh, somebody, a child, the grandfather's color might've made sense to very visibly biracial children who had, you know, a black white parentage in real life makes no sense. But anyway, in this movie, this biracial actress is, is played, um, is playing the daughter of these two black actors, a, a very light complexion, nasty, you know, uppity woman, right? She yeah. has a, she, she's, she has a charm school of some sort, right? So she's that kind of high toned, you know, yeah. she gets her daughter married off to the, you know, most well-off doctor in Harlem. She's that girl. 
and her husband is this really cool bohemian record shop owner who used to be a musician. And I looked at it and I thought, how many good guys like this in our community have been broken? Hmm. You know what I mean? Or, or have, have had experiences that they shouldn't have had because they married light, right? Intentionally, like that to have a woman like that who doesn't seem to be a fit for this man. He, he's a, he should be playing at, at, at a jazz club, right? Like you can see where the dreams have been like reined in yeah. and how she, you know, clamps down on her daughter's dreams and scares away the, you know, jazz musician who's sniffing around her because that's not the type of man you should be around. You need to have this doctor. And just like how that aspiration for, for all of the things that have been conferred with having a, a light-skinned partner. You know, like how many, like these are black businessmen. These are people that were leaders and politicians and, and you know, the, the class of women, uh, of black women that were left to the side, right? When it came time to find a partner, you know, they weren't given access to it. And the ones that were chosen simply because of their complexion and, and how, I, I think I lost my question somewhere in there because I got too deep into Sylvie's love and how much I was, how bothered I was by it. Um, but I'll redirect and say, to I'll, what extent? I'm yeah. sorry. It's interesting because as you're speaking, I'm thinking like, or my question to you is, the frustration that you have seemingly is directed towards the woman, yes, potentially for her crushing his dreams or putting these, you know, whatever energy is on the relationship. And I'm it's more to him. Okay, because I was it's to here, him. What it's is to it? him? Enjoy? It's to him. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's to him, and it's just that, like, why was this the thing that was worth investing in? You know, like you had but one rose to give you know, Mr. Black Bachelor, and you chose to, you know, give it to somebody, you know, ostensibly on the basis of what she looked like. And it's like, if we're voting on, like, if we're going to make decisions about our, our family and our lineage and our and what comes next based on what somebody looks like, I can't believe it's those people that we chose, right? When I say those people, that, it, that, it's, that, that it's our oppressors, right? That we're looking back at the folks that put us on the ships and saying, this is what we're patterning our, our stuff off. This is what success looks like. And so it's not surprising that it manifests in color because it manifests in all these other ways in our lives. But it, it I feel like there's been a betrayal on the part of our women I should say on the part of light complexion women and a lot of black men of, of various complexions as it relates to this, right? That how those two groups of people have participated in maintaining colorism and, and you know, because it does not exist in the same way for black men that, you know, men who should have been invested in dismantling it have instead been okay with it because, you know, as a man, I am still in a position to, you know, as a dark complexion man, I'm more likely to be married, right? Like I'm considered to be the, the most attractive, you know, most masculine, most virile man in the bunch. And so I'm okay with the ways that, you know, we associate dark skin with masculinity because it works for me you know, or because of this internalized, you know, hatred that I have. I'm rambling, y'all, but I'm so yeah. sorry. But well, let, me, let me say this, though, right? And it's taken me years to get to this place. I feel the frustration. I'm not going to say I've let it go, but it's like the more I've come to understand how white supremacy functions, I expect it, mm -hmm. right? Because it's not just about how she looks. It's about what her being on my arm says about me, yeah. right? Cool. About like, how do I perform my masculinity and my value within this structure that puts value on color in a particular way for women, right? So what it means to be a strong, virile man, black man, right? If I am in this position of privilege and I should be able to have any woman of my picking, then you're damn right I'm gonna have a light-skinned one because all of y'all said this is the most preferable woman. Right. All of y'all said that this is the most beautiful black woman. And so I've, and I've heard it so many. I'm sure you have too. having conversations with brothers who are very clear. Right. They're committed to their community. I, I would never date a white woman. I would never go outside the race. I'm going to have a black wife and we're going to have black children. But then it's like she's just going to be black enough, though. You know, like yep. you're going to yep. get credit. <laughs> right. right. It's still going to to fit in this particular mode. And so it's actually what sounds more confusing in the story is, is almost like personality wise, they don't seem like a good fit. Right. So like, 
not only why did you choose her, but why did she choose you? You know, like, yeah, doesn't even seem personality wise like y'all would, would get together. But like, I don't know, it's, it's interesting when we speak about colorism from an internal perspective. I understand the frustrations, but I also know that we're lazy. You know, the work that it would take to dismantle white supremacy for us to get to a space to also be able to dismantle colorism when we can just ride it, right? So similarly, and again, from my perspective, looking at a, light, a lot of light-skinned women who might say, yeah, colorism is messed up and still here I am, I'm going to benefit. What would it mean to give up that privilege? I don't know. That's a question that we can engage. So even thinking of you, Jamila, I know your politics. I know where you stand. We've had so many dope conversations about colorism on a, outside of theory, on a day-to-day-to-day basis, Jamila, what does it look like for you to give up light-skinned privilege? You know, that's something that I am trying to figure out. You know, like that, like I know the ways that I thought I am showing up for dark complexion women, right? Like I can say that when I was a magazine editor, the decisions I made or the, you know, my vote in, in terms of who was going to be on a cover. If you ever saw a light skin cover, a girl on the cover, Ebony, when I was there, just know I downvoted the shit out of her. Like that I fought tooth and nail, like, no, you know what I mean? Like, because why? You know, like unless we were getting Beyonce or Rihanna, what exactly is the point? Because we have so many other options who are not going to be shot by other magazines. And this particular brand had a history, you know, the one that predated us, but it had a history of only wanting, you know, the Lena Horns and the, um, you know, very light complexion black women on the cover. So what if we only do darker brown complexion women? What, what's wrong with that? Why not? You know, right. because also me having the belief that I, as a light skinned woman, see my, I feel reflected when I see a darker complexion woman. I don't expect, I cannot expect a darker complexion woman to have that same reaction when she sees, you know, Zendaya and John David Washington, right? right? You know, I had a reaction to seeing that. So I can imagine that if I'm fatigued of that color, of that pairing, you know, that, that how, how brown, women who have not seen as many people who look like themselves might feel about it in terms of things that I'm giving up, you know, the only thing that I've come up with, and again, so like, when I had opportunity, when I have opportunities to give or to share, and there's a difference between giving things and redistributing, right? And so like, if I am a giver of opportunities, which as an editor I was, I was intentional about like, who's getting these opportunities, right? Like, am I making sure that black women who maybe don't usually get published are getting published? Um, as somebody who's like, okay, I'm independent, I work for myself, you know, what are the things that I might be asked to do that, you know, I could say someone else. I know that I would not allow anybody to ask me to write about colorism, for example, you know, like if it or, or if they did, it would have to be in the context of, you know, who else is talking about this, right? Like, you're not only going to have my perspective, you know, or, or if I were asked to speak on something like that. Um, I, I think now is something I had to just be more intentional about. And I have given out, I have passed along the names of women who I see as is not being adequately represented in media not getting the same opportunities um, you know that I've gotten like I've been intentional about that and oftentimes those women are darker complexion you know because it's not a coincidence that you know that they're also not getting the same you know that these are talented people and, and people that are not getting the same opportunities um, I will say one thing that I have I won't call it a giving up but that I changed recently I'm working on a TV pilot and a rom-com script, uh, two scripts. And so the TV pilot, the lead character is based on me. And so I had her as this self-aware, light complexion woman who, you know, isn't perfect when it comes to those things and makes mistakes, but that she was loosely based on me. So she had that. And so now I'm like, what if there's a character? What if there's an auxiliary character who can speak to some of that stuff you want to say, right? Like what if one of her girlfriends, because her girlfriends are all, you know, darker complexion or brown skin. And so I was like, okay, well, you know, and she's not the glamorous one out the crew either, right? And so she's not the one who's in the happy, healthy relationship. And I was intentional about like, you know, her girl, one of her girlfriends who is dark complexion in heavy set is the one who's in a happy, healthy relationship from day one until the end. Like that, because that's not something that we've seen represented enough. Her queer male friend is in a happy, healthy relationship because we, with a black man, because right. that's nothing you don't see enough. But why does the lead complex character have to look like me? We can get to 
the same shit I want to get to, you know, and, and have, because I wanted to present somebody who could talk about these things and still get things wrong, but at least had the intention. Because right. the, the few times you see colorism represented at all on TV, there's the, the clueless light complexion person who's, you know, oops, I didn't know, you know? And like, so there's not really like, for them learning is starting at the very beginning. They don't right. know anything, you know? And right. so it's like, what if we didn't start at the beginning? What if we were able to get deeper? You know what I mean? Like, what if we could take it to the next level and talk about what does her giving up things look like, you know? And so, but I, I do think that it may be a way to instead explore that. You know, no one told me to write this show. I didn't get hired to do it. So in this world, she can be, you know, she can be a dark complexion one. But I also have thought about like, does what I'm grappling with now, because I am very clear how my complexion has allowed me to walk through certain doors. You know what I mean? Like at the very least, if it hasn't opened the door, it has allowed me to be heard when I got in. Um, so does a dark complexion girl get to have this set of experiences, right? But to that, I say, well, we can imagine Game of Thrones, like we can imagine Dracula and shit. Why can't I just create this fabulous, you know, and it's not that it's all fabulous, but that, you know, like, like pretend that that privilege wasn't what helped right. me get to what I am. And this girl is doing, you know, she's, she's far more fabulous and successful than I am. But, you know, I, I think that that by painting images, like, Insofar as I'm able to paint images of black women, I am not interested in painting them to look like me. I think that's something that, and I think there's something that a lot of millennial writers, because we write about ourselves and we started with blogging, and you know, like that's hard to give up. But I think there've been a whole lot of stories about people told who look like me or who they've been acted out by people who look like me. And I wish they were better stories, but you know, I'd rather tell stories that uh, more black people can relate to and that more black women can feel loved and affirmed by. But that's interesting too, because it's like, again, I think in the context, I think a lot of people just keep doing what's always been done because those are the stories that get sold, right? So like the work that it would take for you to perhaps convince a network or whomever to buy into this is like, you would have to do the work to explain to them why this is necessary, as opposed to like, well, this is what we've been doing and we've got numbers to show that this is what's been selling. So why don't you just keep telling the story in the same way? But it's like, we need, you know, all of that variety. But what's so interesting, I'll say this in this moment, Jamila, what's interesting, I knew this would happen with us. There's always this thing that happens in-house conversations about this work. So we have a conversation about Black racial identity, and then we get to colorism, mm -hmm. right? We, we, we go straight yep. to colorism, right? It's not always that part. Right. And so, again, for me, like wanting to reel us back in to the point of like what how does the the part of and I'm, I'm speaking to you directly, the aspect of the black racial identity, like what does what 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 role does that play in this conversation, if at all? Because I feel like with you, the blackness is a given. So, OK, cool. Right. Mm -hmm. But for a lot of folks, the blackness is not a given. It's a struggle. It's a struggle to sit in, to name, right? And then also given the kind of like, dare I say, rejection that they feel from other black folks, you know, mm -hmm. it's it's where they sit. And so I just remember when the, the book was first released and so many of the public conversations, there were so many different conversations happening. And I think folks were also like confused about like my position perhaps mm -hmm. on things because they're like, well, I thought you were doing work on color. I, it almost feels like folks felt like I was giving light folks, light skinned folks a pass, mm. right? Whatever that means or that I was somehow saying that like colorism, like, I don't know. And you know I, what you felt like it was two different things happening though. I think, I don't think that it was that you were giving colorism a pass in a way. This book confers black identity on a group of people that it is at times convenient to, to strip it away from, hmm. right? Like it, and it, it's a weirder intersection, I think, than even being like black cishet men, right? At this direct, like, 
these very specific and unique challenges and things that could happen to you that could befall you because you are a black man, but then also these unique ways that you are privileged within the context of our community. And we don't really celebrate what it means to be privileged in our community. So we care about Trayvon. We care about Mike Brown. We care about naming the violence against them. We care about protecting the black man or boy who's been accused of assaulting a little black man or a little black boy or girl or woman, because we know black men are a dangerous species and we have to protect them. Them, right. And so like that is a privilege that does not seem for, for most brothers, you know, when when confronted with it, it's like that ain't shit. You know, that's not going to stop me from getting killed by the police. It's not going to help me get a job in most circumstances. You know, it, it's not going to guarantee a good long life for me. So what does it mean? The, the, the love and honor of black women, essentially. Puh, right. That, that That's irrelevant. I think that with light complexion, you know, and particularly biracial black people, you've got these distinct advantages that you have in the black community, but you have this way that you're disconnected. But you're also inherently, if you're if the mixture is white, you're inherently disconnected from the other side because even if your white family loved you, poured affirmation on you, even if they raised you to love and celebrate being black, right? Like I like I had a white grandmother who was like, I love my son. He's black. He is a black child. I never, you know, there was no people weren't saying mixed, you know, back in the 50s anyway. Um yeah. you either were or you won't, but it but it wasn't something that was, you know, presented to him within the context of her as something to be a challenge. Um maybe other parts of the family. But like even if you even if you have good white folks around you, you can't be a part of whiteness in the way that you can be a part of blackness because they're not going to let you in. You might like the same TV shows. You may eat some of the same foods and go to the same schools. You can share energy and vibes and time, but you can't be a part of them. Yeah. Right. And if you feel and, and the, I think the greatest struggle is experience, you know, internally, at least amongst those that do feel like they're a part of them, that do feel like they deeply identify with the people, you know, perhaps because these are just simply the people around them. You know, because in all these other ways, I'm like you, I'm like you, but I'm not and I can't be. And so to come to us, we become either this source of additional trauma, right? You know, because we're not letting you in. But more often than not, you know, even if we're even if there's questions about your hair, you know, or where are you from, what you mix with, I think there's a lot like. Yes, there are certainly mixed race, light complexion, black people who've been tormented by other black people on, on this, you know, and in devastating ways. I'm not going to negate that. But I think when we're talking about cumulatively, right, like overwhelmingly, what is more likely to happen is that you are going to be treated um, better in, in some regard, in some black spaces, right, that you are going to be treated with respect, that you are going to be, you know, given the opportunity to be coded as pretty or smart or good or kind or nice or useful right. and youthful in ways that other black people are not. And so to say to somebody who's traumatized and broken by the fact that half your blood don't fuck with you, that now you have to pony up and pay what you owe because you got this VIP seat up in here. And so the thing is you got the VIP seat in the colored section. So it's the same reaction as the men. This ain't shit. What am I supposed to do with this? I can still get killed by the police. I can still, you know, get passed over for, you know, a job. I can still get sexually assaulted, more likely to be assaulted than, you know, women of other races. All of these things still hold up for me to some extent. And there's also, I think most of us don't have access to any sort of data. Like those of us who have engaged with the data we see, we're like life outcomes typically are better for light complexion black people. You know, and when we come into relationships, and romance that gets a little bit dicier, but it does typically privilege like complexion black women. That doesn't mean that you were not the black girl at your school who got called a, a gorilla and a monkey. I know black women who are as you know light as the, the wallpaper behind me who had the experience of being called a monkey and a nigger and being you know. That's why Danielle's story stuck out to me because again, in my imagination, right, whatever it meant to be light skin didn't come with that. Right. But this is a this is a question I'm I'm grappling with, yeah, but so what does that mean? So if I'm Danielle or I've had I've had this experience with white folks, to bring that to a black woman who's had that experience with black people mm -hmm. and expect to be welcomed as a sister and mm -hmm. to expect to be to be seen as, you know, we go we're in this together. That is a hell of a, that is a tall order because at the very least, you are not as likely to get your ass kicked at home, at, at, at our, in this home, 
You know, mm -hmm. we all understand the white folks think, you know, that's what happens when you be mixed anyway. White folks was never gonna love you. That's not what they do. They don't love niggas. You're a half nigga, you're a part nigga, they don't like you, right? But for black people to have made black people, particularly black women and girls that are darker complexion, right? For there to have been, for you it to have been a way to get social capital on social media in, in the, two, you know, in the 2008, 2009, 2010, you know, to make jokes about black women and to be able to specifically target dark complexion black women. I, I don't know what the answer is for getting these two groups of people who've had different, who have different pain points, you know, um, to truly understand each other and, and to, yeah. No, and I'm glad you said that. Cause I, and I'm thinking of my own process. Like I think part of the journey in terms of being open to even recognizing that there's a multiplicity of experiences within blackness, that, that, that identity piece was important because it, it felt like multiple things happening. Like if we can agree that we're black now, let's start having the conversation. Like one didn't negate the other. Right. right? But like, first and foremost, again, I'm growing up in the space where we've created different categories even. So you don't even have to say the, you don't even have to call it. You don't even right. have to say I'm black. You can say I'm Creole. Right. And so again, within that framework, it's like, if I give you the option, which if I'm quite honest, it's a conversation we continue to have now. Folks are still struggling with the language piece of it, right? Mixed by, these are new terms. I'm in my forties. Mixed by racial, these are new options. You were black before, right? Creole option. Again, so in my estimation and in my experience, if you were given the option to identify as something else, you did. Puerto Rican, something else. Right. And the more I talk to people from all over the world, it's like, yeah, people become Puerto Rican when they leave Puerto Rico. In Puerto Rico, you black. Right. <laughs> like we got that negative. You got that language there, too. You know, mm -hmm. so for me, it's like, OK, this is new for me to meet people who have the option to be something else to say I'm black. To me, that was like, oh, I want to talk to y'all. Help me understand mm -hmm. something different, because perhaps you're my people in ways that I haven't allowed you to be before right but then it's like not but then but and then it's also like i think among in between us there are folks similarly to you like yeah y'all yeah, yeah, black and still <laughs> this is the reality that we're dealing with and when are we going to address this and so i guess what i'm saying is i'm wondering if there's a way for us to have the conversations or have the conversations in a way that because sometimes it feels like i've been asked almost to Put them, you know, on a hierarchy. Like, what's more important? I can't mm. separate these things because even as much as we talk about, we you you named the brothers who we've lost to police brutality. The way my mind thinks when I scan images, Jamila, they are all brown. What did their brown skin communicate to police yeah. enforcement about? When I think of 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 George Floyd, big black man. Would he have been treated in the way he was treated had he been lighter skin? Had he been mixed race? Would they have felt the need? You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And so, like, I I don't separate color from any of the conversations necessarily. You know, like it's a part of all of it, and I think we have to be comfortable. And maybe comfortable is not the word, but we have to we have to address it. You know, I, I don't know how we separate it, but for me, and again, I'm just speaking, I guess, perhaps of what I needed to be able to move forward with the conversation. Something about claiming a black identity changed the game for me. Because I was in an experience where people had the option not to. Yeah. You know, so even me, quite honestly, when I hear people, that's why it was the first question, how do you identify? Something in my mind changes a little bit. Like the language you choose tells me a little bit about you. So if you, if the first word you say is I'm mixed, yep. help me understand what that means, right? Because one of, I think it was Jay Smooth in the book, mm -hmm. he talked about the language of mix and he's like, it's a word, but it doesn't really align with a lived experience. No. Yes, I have a white parent. Yes, I have a black parent. But as I walk through the world, what is mixed? What's right. that mean? And there are people having a mixed experience. That's the thing. And that like that. What is a mixed experience? Uh, I should say not a mixed experience, but there are, I should say, 
there is an experience that attempts to be a mixed experience that I think that some mixed race couples want to create for their children that leads to this trauma and confusion and disillusionment as they get older when they see that the world outside of their house is not mulatopia. You know, it, 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 it's it's people are organized and, and categorized in certain ways and whether, you know, that categorization is done in love and celebration or, you know, in the way that we say we're, we're celebrating the black community, we're coming together as brothers and sisters, or if it's how other people identify you as part of this group that they loathe, either way, you know, to be both and, you know, it is not something that's really possible. But I think that the other, like one of the other complications is just the very, there's no universal way in which, I mean, there's no one way in which any of us are being raised, right? There are families of black people that everyone in the household looks like you and everybody brought home a white partner because white supremacy was still the value in the house and it was taught and, you know, and it manifested in that yeah. way, right? Yeah. Like there, there are, are people that, you know, you may have the white mom and black dad combination that we most often think of when we think of somebody being biracial, where the parents were both activists and very, you know, civically engaged and very intentional about, you know, raising a child who is proud of who they are and understands that they have mixed heritage, but they exist in the world as a black person and what that means and what the privilege is, right? But then you also have... And not to cut you off, but I think that's also, I hear most from white mothers of mixed race children who are struggling with like what that means because what's interesting, and again, these are things that maybe you, but definitely me, I've, I've never had to consider. My parents didn't have to sit me down and tell me anything about who I was other than you're Ghanaian, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, but the idea that for many white mothers feeling left out, like biracial or mixed becomes a term that they give to their children as a way to make sure that they're included in the way yep. that their child, right? Yep. Identified or self identifies. And I've said this <laughs> publicly, but I've also said it, you know, one on one with women. That I, I think that's selfish. Absolutely. You know, because you want to be included in how they identify, but how, does the world see you as they walk through the world? Like you being their parent, does that change their? their life outcomes or, or how they're able to move to the world. And also, and I don't know, should we be able to name ourselves? Why wasn't black given as an option? Right, right. That I, I agree. I think that that is, you know, it, it's an act of cruelty. It, it's selfish and it it is, you know, it doesn't teach the child what having that white parent, how it does inform how they walk in the world. There will be privilege, that there will be, you know, ways that you may be treated or embraced or comfortable in certain spaces where some of your other black friends may not. But that does not mean that you are not still black, you know, and if you are not clear, like you can be black and right. We can. But, but you have to start with black because that is, you know, something that is inextricable from who you are and how you experience the world. But like at I was when you said you're hearing from the mothers, I was thinking, well, you ain't gonna hear from the fathers. Why not? Because one, the father who need the father who would reach out to you about about this sort of thing would need to, because he would have, you know, he'd have his shit together on his own. You know, like he would have, I mean, I guess it's like, what would he be reaching out to you for, right? Like if he were reaching out to a biracial person about what that experience is like, you know, what does it mean to, to be of mixed heritage? And I want to help my child do that. That's one thing. But if they're reaching out to somebody whose expertise is in uh, racial identity, that says to me that they are not seeing this as a black child or they don't want to see this as a black child because what would be confusing to them? Like it should be the, you know what I mean? Like it, it should be the moms reaching out. But on the flip side, the reason I say it's not going to be the dads is because so often it's the dads who got the, the fucked up racial politics. And I'm not saying they have them alone, you know, yeah. but, but at the point where mom is reaching out, at least something in her has something in her mind has been a lot for her to realize that there's something that she needs to know about her child that she doesn't naturally know. Right. You know, like I got a letter to, I do a parenting advice column. We got a letter from a white mom. Um, they don't have a child yet, but she's, in, I think, engaged, planning to be married and planning to have her black boyfriend's child. And, and she's had experience with black men before. She's had experience with black men who she who made her feel like she was some sort of trophy in the past. And, you know, because she was a white woman. So she seems to be sensitive to that. But this guy has talked about having 
blonde haired, blue eyed, white looking children with her. And she is not a blonde haired, blue eyed, white looking woman. I mean, she's white, but she does not have those features. But, you know, even if she did, I'm like, girl, you need to run, run, <laughs> run, run. Yes. Like this person has some issues and they're bringing some issues to the table. And that's the, you know, the, the part that's hard to speak to because we don't know how and why every you know, anybody was born or what connected their parents. But we have seen enough evidence that points to when white supremacy brings a couple together, as opposed to love, shared interests, you right. know, natural circumstances. Oh, we were both in this the same graduate program. Oh, this was my next door neighbor. We fell for each other. I never dated a white girl. It just happened. She's my person right. versus somebody who's got some issues with themselves. Yeah. And I think that's why also for me, when I sit back and I look at the work and I think about the conversations that folks continue to have, why it was important to kind of like put the work out there and have the conversation is because there are conversations that we don't have. There are things that we take for granted. I think there are a lot of us who still think or believe that there's some racial utopia that happens when we just all hold hands and get along. Right. Or there's some racial utopia. Like when people keep talking about, you know, the projections of when 20 something, it's gonna, you know, in 2059, the mixed race population is gonna, why do we keep, why is that a concern, right? right. Like, what will that ultimately change about our racial politics? Like, if 50% of the population is biracial by the year 20, whatever, what's that gonna change about racial politics? Right. Because again, we still believe that somehow, you know, when black and white come together and have these mixed race children, that somehow we're changing the landscape of our lived experience. When in reality, like you talking about that father, or even the question of like, why would the father reach out to you? I personally know a lot of black men who, who privilege whiteness in a particular way, who think they probably coming up if they have mixed race children, right? I can't imagine what conversations between a father and child would be if you somehow think your child is now a trophy or you think that you have somehow come up, like what level of privilege are you giving that, not, not giving, but bestowing upon that child? You know what I mean? Like well, now that the walls have tumbled on the halls of Kardashian, I'm sure at some point we will get to hear from somebody's perspective, what it what it looks like or feels like when your parent thinks that you are a, a Kanye, day's trophy. Isn't Kanye the poster child? He made it very clear what his goal was, and his goal was to get Kim Kardashian and to have these children. Yeah, but if yeah. Kanye West were a woman, the conversations that we would have had about him and his racial identity, first of all, like the fact we would have had conversations about him and racial identity, full stop. I've seen this grown black man wear blue contacts and dye his hair blonde as a full adult. He's not, you know, Jaden Smith or somebody. He's not, you know, into punk culture where he's doing that type of shit. He's a regular ass black man from the South Side of Chicago who has gotten into lipo and, and blonde hair and blue eyes and MAGA hats. And there's no way we would let a, woman, a sister get away with that and not say, and, and having all these mixed race children. We would say, what is up with you and how you feel about your people? Why aren't we saying it about him? I don't know. He gets a pass as in many, as, as many brothers get a pass, like he's allowed to be an artist in that way. Black women can hardly do anything without our loyalty to our race being questioned, right? Whether it's what we do to our hair, our skin, what we wear, any kind of body politics is always connected to some level of loyalty to our race, whereas black men get to do all manner of things. Are there any questions? <laughs> Does anybody want to talk to us? We've been talking a lot because we can do this. Um, but yeah, no, that's why I appreciate talking to you because there's so many other aspects. If I'm quite honest, Jamila, that folks aren't willing to have, these aren't new conversations. I think what's new about them is that we have the audacity to have them in public. Yeah. Yeah. And there are a lot of people who don't want to have these conversations in public because of what that might mean or what that might expose and, yeah, they're conversations we ultimately, we, we have to be having or at least be thinking about, you know, but we don't have these conversations out loud. And we definitely don't have these conversations in mixed company. Hmm. Do you think that colorism is, is just one of the areas in which we've been 
uh, we've just been beaten into submission in, in ways that we haven't with, with other things. Like there are things that we name, right? That we talk about police violence and we talk about representation and there not being enough black people in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And like, I think that's why I was so rattled by, I love Sylvie's Love. You know, it was a very sweet movie. It was very light complexion in a lot of ways. There are two white female characters that did not need to be white women that I think had these been dark complexion, black women, right? Like that then I, in the context of the film, it could still make sense, mm -hmm. you know? And so it's just like you to like, of all people to give these, to give space to in a black movie is, is white women, you know, was strange to me. And you've got a light complexion female lead and her romantic foil, who's this uh, thirsty woman who's interested in her dude, who he was kind of messing around with before, is a glamorous, beautiful dancer, but a dark complexion woman, right? And I, I the, that I would never ever conceive of any writing any story unless it's a, an act of truth, right? Like this is based on true events. These are real people and they're depicting them as they as they existed. I would never ever say if I want you to root for this light complexion woman that I'm going to make the per her romantic foil, right? The person she's competing with. That's a plot line on Grownish right now, you know, for all the talk about the complexion in the Kenya Barris cinematic universe. And I, I enjoy his shows, but that is the thing that hangs over them like such a just fucked up cloud, you know, like that, the, bro, you got some color issues. Like there's a, like every girl on every show got to look like your wife and kids, you yeah. know, like th does every man on every show have to look like you? Because it seems to me that you, you know, you've casted some different looking black men in roles. Um, mm -hmm. But that like, oh, I think I lost my train of thought for a minute. Even like Lovecraft County. I know we could be here all night if we got into what's going on. Like with, with Let me just say this. I love Lovecraft, right? But the thing that, okay. And this is a whole nother conversation we likely gonna need to have about color in Hollywood. The thing that annoys me about Hollywood portrayals oftentimes is it feels like you don't give your black audience enough credit for the ways in which we're gonna think critically. I'm the person who's gonna watch this play out and be like, and I can't think of any character's name in this moment, Journey Smollett's character, right? And then her sister and her brother. Why come she light and they brown? Is there a story here? Are we going to get a story? Did mama step out? Is her right. dad white? Was mama assaulted? Why is that the case? Happen? Something like, happened. This the, doesn't the, just naturally happen. It doesn't happen. The Cosby show thing. I can look at the Cosby show now and be like, y'all tried it. They but tried the it time, twice. Twice. Add it up, the added the a fifth one. Add, like, let's add another light skin girl. We're so starved yep. for black imagery that will take it whichever. I love This Is Us. This Is Us is one of my favorite shows. But all of the Kevin, all of the uh, Randalls, Randall done gone light, dark, light, dark. Ha! Y'all took an effort to make sure that Kate and Kevin, they look characteristic like, like they could be the same child growing up. But you insert black child here, it feels so offensive to our lived experiences. Like this, you can't tell me that in this moment that you're so starved for black actors that you have to go. Randall, grown Randall is brown like me. I was never light skin, y'all. Never. It wasn't possible. It wasn't gonna happen. How did light skin Randall happen? We can't just like blink and make like it's not okay. And so for me, it feels offensive because. Y'all have budget lines for all manner of things. You mean to tell me you can't put, you can't exert effort to make sure that you can get a brown thin little boy. Right. Even if you got to train him, because how many lines do those kids have in the flashbacks? Even if you have to train him just for the sake of giving us a consistent narrative, but black people don't matter enough. Insert black person here. However, which way you define black. It doesn't work for us. And so for for me, color in Hollywood, that's how it gets messy because I just don't think y'all respect blackness as a lived experience. We, now, we all black, right? Right. And so that way we can just show up arbitrarily and you know, in our families. And I wonder to what extent has that skewed people's you know, black people, right? The people who matter in this equation most, like our ability to recognize and understand color and how it functions in our families and that this came from somewhere. There's a reason that this person looks different. You know, I've never seen Lovecraft County because I was just, I saw the poster and I was like, oh, I'm good. Like, it's good. I, 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 I'm going to tell you,
tell you why. And I, I and now I don't want you know because of of what's happened. Shout out to Amber Phillips for her her uh, reporting yeah. and and yeah. um and yeah. thorough excoriation of what took place with the extra who was darkened, which was just like completely nonsensical. I had never seen the show because, and I like Journey Smollett as an actress. I just that tab like that tableau. I was like again. Dark okay. skin do light skin what it just for me it was like I'm tired and and you know like something that came to me uh, a phrase you know I may have heard it somewhere it may have just been whispered in my ear by an ancestor but it came to me uh, a couple months ago and I've been saying it to myself a lot and it's connecting some stuff with my little one and with my mother but hurt the mother hurt the daughter mm-hmm. you know and I knowing what my mother's experiences were and that my mom who's you know just a little bit she's a couple shades lighter than you not much. You know, like she did not get to see, you know, to this day, she still does not routinely get to see women who look like her on TV being loved, you know, being treated well, being, you know, happy and safe. Not everybody on TV has to be Claire Huxley. I mean, Claire was browner, you know, yes. but she was like, yes. she was browner, you yes, know, but, but, but the, hair, the hair put in another category. Right, right. You know, she's very much a certain kind of 80s black lady, you know, and, and, but even that being, uh, better than the, what was the woman? I mean, it's probably not the best ex- example because she's not the most A-list actress, but everybody's girlfriend looks like Roger's wife on what's happening now, right? Anna, oh, what's her name? Um, She uh, she was on Living, she guest starred on Living Single. We saw it the other day and she was really funny. She oh, you, she, she was the light skin girlfriend of the 80s and, and, and 90s, right? And like everybody looked like that. And so for me to still be seeing that with with all, uh, like- We have a expectation. We would like to see some growth and some change, and we just haven't seen it. It's 2021, and we still have the light-skinned girlfriend. We still have the dark-skinned sidekick, still. And to demand it is to not, like, we can't keep supporting it. That's the thing. You know, that's the tricky part. And then it's like, you know, you said we're so starved for images. And then on one hand, it's like, do I support a good Black project if everyone says it's a good Black project? Or do I say... I don't want to see that combination again. And I'm not going to, you know, Sylvie's love was my light skin love of the year. Like I saw one, it was great. I loved it, but I'm not, you know, everybody else. I, I would like to see something. I would like to see something else. And I know what it means to me to see something else. I know it means a whole lot more to little girls that are not seeing themselves on TV. Oh, absolutely. I was starved. I wasn't, I was 22. You know, before I saw Alec Weck on the cover of Elle, and that was the first time they had a black woman on the cover in its then 52 year history. And what's interesting, and me and my best friend Chantrell have this conversation all the time, what I can recognize now as a grown woman is that in being starved, I tend to imagine myself much darker than I actually am. Mm. Like I have connected, not connected, Fenty, I love Fenty makeup. When I walked into Sephora to buy, when it came out, I automatically went for the darkest shade and got home and was Mm. like, what is happening here? Because in my mind, in the history of makeup, I was always the darkest shade, even if it didn't match. And now we have folks who are giving us incremental changes that we actually represent. And in my mind, so you can't tell me, me and Elekwek aren't the same complexion. Right, there, there, there are implications for not even seeing that we come in a variety of shades. And so, yes, we're starved to see ourselves. And for little girls, it is, it's paramount. It's paramount. We were watching Netflix the other day. We were on our way out the house, my daughter and I, my daughter's almost eight. And, um, you know, they have, you have multiple profiles for households. So there was her profile, you know, was logged in. So there was suggesting primarily kids shows, right? So, you know, when the shows, when you have it on, um, like whatever we'd watch had gone off. So it's just showing us different, it's like the home screen, right? Yeah. Like, so it's showing previews of different shows. I timed it. It took five minutes for us to see a brown skin black woman or girl. And the first one we saw was Michelle Obama, five minutes. Do you know how many previews come up in five minutes when it's just kind of going like, this yeah. we sat here and watched the first one was michelle obama right and then the net and it was seven minutes in total so two minutes later we saw a dark complexion black girl you know and she was like a cast member on a dance show you know so this isn't an actress this isn't somebody who's you know nickelodeon so and so i'm that girl and everybody wants to be me right 
these children's shows. I'm so excited for Marcy Martin because she just got a new, she sold a, a kid's show, I think, for Disney. Um, and they released the cast and everybody's, you know, they're all brown skinned black girls, you know. Right. Um, but like on Disney and Nickelodeon, particularly the shows that were made uh, a few years ago that a lot of kids are still watching um, on streaming services. Lots of little black boys. Black boys are usually brown. Mm -hmm. You know, many of them, your complexion, maybe a little bit lighter. You know, they're usually, they're brown, they're dark complexion. The yeah. girls, when they are there, when they are there, because more often than not, black girls are just not in the equation, mixed or otherwise. But when they are there, they are very light complexion mixed girls. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and like you see little white girls having, my best friend is this black boy. You see a lot of that. The girls mm -hmm. are just absent. Mm -hmm. But again, when we again come back and connect the dots, don't then wait till we're grown to start having these questions about why we do what we do. Right. You mad at us for bleaching our skin. You're not mad at the skin bleaching industry. Yep. Right. Like you act like these dots aren't connected. You, you're mad at us for straightening our hair. Where have we ever been shown that it is OK for our hair to grow out of our head as it is and still be called beautiful when even as children, that's what I'm saying. Like, even when you think of the proud family, like none of this, is, none of it is arbitrary. When you think about the images that are, I mean, I even look at my, my seven year old granddaughter. We have come. We have direct conversations about this all the time, even for like when they make what do you call the little the the what am I? This is such an auntie moment. The little avatars. Uh huh. We have conversations about the complexions that she chooses, the hair texture that she chooses. She's so sick of me, but I'm yep. like, I know there are incremental differences, but you chose this one, <laughs> you know? And yep. why? I, I and again, I know I think way too much, probably too much. But even when I'm texting and folks send me their memoji or their, you know, their their Apple yep. uh, emoji, why you pick that complexion, sis? That's not you. I'm judging. <laughs> You are allowed to go darker, but never lighter. That is the rule. If you go lighter, something's wrong with you. You're crazy. And some rapper posted his emoji. Maybe it was plies or somebody. And the and the person was visibly lighter. And I had a dude who tried to holler at me who sent me, you know, his. And I'd say he was about my complexion. But he was using, like, the lightest, like, the not white. But, like, I was just like. That's not you. That ain't you. You could have gone up. Why didn't you go up? But you don't see yourself as up. It's funny you mentioned Fenty. I have a Fenty idea I'm going to share with you off the after the chat. But um, I spent a good amount of money on Fenty Foundation over the years, and I've yet to buy the right shade. I always go to dark, mm. right? I just I I look at the pit, you know. I mean, and especially it's harder now because you can't take it out in the store in the same way and stuff. But just even the, and even before, just trying to trying to try foundation in stores never worked for me. And it's oftentimes been in the eye of the makeup artist helping me. You know, like I would find that uh, if it was a non-black artist, which usually wouldn't be the case, but if it were a non-black artist, they would usually give me stuff that was too dark. And hmm. that at times black artists would either get it right, but if they got it wrong, they might go too light. Hmm. You know, and it would always, it would be that they weren't used to buying my shade, which I get, I think that's everybody, right? Like, where, you know, I'm, I'm used to looking at foundation that looks like mine, but I, like, I think the first one I got was 370. And that's not my color, no. you know? And then I tried 340 and that was also not my color. I'm still not exactly sure where I am. It might be a 315, a 312 or something that she doesn't make yet, but I just would not have put myself in that. I was like, oh, okay, well here, here we go. Yeah. That also could be from years of us buying makeup, though, and just that there weren't as many variances and shades available. It yeah, it wasn't there. We didn't have it. And so it, it, I promise you, it is very hard for me when I see the display. Again, I'm just so used to going to the very end. And I'm like four shades off of the end. And that's like, there are people darker than me. And it, it, it's, it's still hard because of my lived experience. I've always been the darkest. Not just the, I've been the African at that. Right. So I've always been the darkest person. And so like big ups to Fenty, big ups to all these makeup brands now that are, you know, creating foundation that actually matches people's, you know, complexions. But again, having a lived experience where, you know, we didn't see that variety. I'm grown and it still impacts me. Absolutely. You know, so. What y'all talking about in these comments? Y'all talking about anything? Because we are running our mouths. Um, YouTube made me think of when a new acquaintance identifies as mixed and not black first. I draw conclusions. Why? 
that's a good reason to draw conclusions. I mean, again, I think again, there's no judgment, right? But that's why, you know, coming back to the book, since that's what we're supposed to be talking about. Yeah. Um, <laughs> in the interviews, it's the first question. It's the open-ended question. How do you identify racially and culturally? I wanted them to tell me. And then I wanted to know what that, what those words meant for them. You know, there are folks who will use mixed and see mixed as much different than biracial. I think biracial is a newer term. And for some people, it speaks to a particular politic that they're not down with. Um, and then there are folks who are like, I'm, I'm, I'm black. And then there's also folks who say African-American versus black. Again, all of these words, again, for me, I don't think these are things that we think critically enough about, particularly for a lot of folks who just go with the politically correct language of the time. You know, and again, once you know that history, you know, these folks haven't had it right themselves. So we can't necessarily just go by the language that we're given because the problematics of using African-American for everyone is that everybody's not American. Right. So then how do we account for folks who look like us, who live all over the world with a capital B black? The fact that we even had to have a whole movement to get black capitalized <laughs> as we write about it. You know what I mean? So again, these are things that folks don't, I don't think folks think critically enough about and don't have to, but I think that that's natural. How you choose to identify should tell me something about you, right? How do you identify Jamila? Black. Always been black? I went through an African-American period when I was younger and I remember arguing about it with my best friend. I wanted to, I only went with it because it had African in it. And so that to me felt like it was a better way of honoring, you know, our ancestors as opposed to just, you know, this, the, the idea of color. Right. Um, but, you know, my father will, will a straight face tell you African, you know, I mean, I, I think he'll say black more often, but I think we talk about like the, in here, you know, it's been African that we are, you know, like that was the conversations that I grew up having. We are African people as African people, you know, we don't like, I have two sisters who have a different mother than I have. And, you know, and so I remember it being like when, when we were introduced, cause I was about seven when I met them, you know, I was saying when we are African people, we don't do that half brother step. We don't, I don't ever want to hear you say that shit. You know, and so that was so like I thought I had these things in my mind that were like, you know, as an African person, I have this responsibility to other black people, I have these ways that I show up in the world. But I, I think getting out into like Chicago's diff is different than the East Coast, you know, like because when you talk, it's certainly different than New Orleans, right? It's that sure. everything you described encountering, I encountered in my neighborhood, you know, and so that you would have your Rosa Clemente, who was the out and proud Afro Latina, and you would also have your white passing, you know, would never identify with the black blood, you know, deep within them, kind of pearl clutchy, well, do, you know, uh, Latinx folks were around too, you know, um, there were a lot of biracial people that would have identified as biracial. And there were a lot of people that would have been like, I'm black. And then if you were to ask a few more questions, you would find out that maybe they had a parent who wasn't black, but that they identified as black, right? Yeah. So none of this was like, as, you know, curious to me as it is to, I, I think, a folks that didn't grow up in places like that. But, you know, it wasn't until I got to the East Coast and until I got to college and came across more continent, you know, continental Africans who kind of balked at the idea of us calling ourselves African like you, you know, like I, I have this sweatshirt that says African. And I wore, you know, I, I had it on once and I forget where the brother was from who asked me where I was from. When I told him, he just laughed, you know, <laughs> it's like, oh, that's cute. You know, um, and, and I don't allow that to keep me from feeling, you know, this sense of connection to, you know, my ancestors and where I'm from. But I do realize that my Africanness exists in an American context. So black has been the easiest, you know, and easiest I always, words. I always take the position and pull rank and be like, OK, I also know from the other side of things. And I tell my cousins this all the time, like, OK, you may have been born and raised in Ghana, but you're still politically not in a position to be telling people who they are. Because are you African? Because white supremacy has gotten us all. Right. right. So as much as you are jumping at the like, I think these are the things I think about. Me and my father have yet to have an honest conversation about this. But like what it means. I, and I watch 90 Day Fiance way too much. Right. Mm. 
what it means for someone to be willing to give up, like understand what America represents for people. Like you are willing to give up everything, everything, everything you're connected to for the chance, for the opportunity, potentially it's not even given, right? Like how, how do y'all value America and Americanity to the extent that you throw all of this away just for the opportunity to go start somewhere new? Like you're not in a position to tell me who I am. That's me judging you. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. so I've had so many, particularly working on college campuses, I've had lots of beef, lots of rat beef between continental African students and, and African-American students. I remember at one school, the Black Student Union for Black History Month decided they were going to put all of the African flags in the student union, like that was going to be part of their process of celebrating. And they got this letter from the African Student Union demanding that they take all of the flags down because it wasn't reflective of Black History Month. And when we finally had the intervention, what came out was like, yo, like y'all, y'all don't kick it with us any other time, right? Y'all not mm -hmm. trying to do that any other time. Y'all see y'allselves as distinct from us any other time. Don't wait for February to start rocking our flags. If you're gonna be African, be African 365. And so it was it, again for me conversation just opens up so much. And these are conversations I think that we know how to have or that we even know how to call for. You know what I mean? How do I pull you to the table and say, sis, we need to have this conversation without it being a fight. Right. But they're conversations that need to be had. Absolutely. For sure. All right. Well, we don't kept the people 30 minutes too long. I was sitting here, I was like, was it maybe it was 90 minutes? So I was like, okay, I gotta think of some more. I mean, we could keep going forever, but I was like, okay, 90 minutes. This was a little bit longer than I expected, but it was good. <laughs> I didn't have any questions. I guess that's okay. Well, people stuck it. There are more people than when we started, so it's not the people we're leaving. Y'all still here. Well, thank you for being here. <laughs> thank y'all for staying. But yes, thank you, man. Patience to have. Yes, thank you. This was excellent. Thank you so much, Yaba, for being generous with your, your time and energy as always. Thank you. Thank you. I'm excited. Of course, there's always more that we can talk about, and I'm sure we will. But thank you all for being here. And buy my book. <laughs> buy the book. Buy the book. There's a button right there. That's the green button. Buy the book. Thank you both so much for joining us tonight. This was such a great conversation. Um, Krista said it. Thank you for being so generous with your time and being with Book Soup and finishing your your current leg of your tour on books with Book Soup. Um, and thank you, Jamila, for joining us. It was so great to see you again. And everyone, have a wonderful night. Yes. And thank congratulations you. on your book. It's really thank important. You. Congratulations. Thank you. All right. Bye. <laughs>